Well, the new Animaniacs show finally launched last year after being a hoax for the past five years, and it has now introduced a whole new generation of kids to being an ironically detached and pop culture obsessed furry fr- Oh wait, shit, that's just how everyone was anyway. Either way, with this new show on everyone's favorite streaming service, Hulu, a few old debates have started up like, was this show always so reliant on pop culture and political jokes? We finally broke that glass ceiling. No, but it certainly does feel like it's raining shards of glass all around us. Or, where is my milky mommy Minerva Mink? Which is a more valid question than the first one I asked. I want to highlight the resurrection of an old debate, though, because I feel like it's definitely worth going into detail and is not so cut and dry. And that is, if Animaniacs is really the superior show to its sister series, Tiny Toon Adventures. Now, Tiny Toons is also on Hulu, so I'm sure a lot of nostalgia poisoned folks that clapped at the Jurassic Park parody at the start of Animaniacs, maybe also peaked a few episodes of that other show they may remember. You know, the one with the cotton candy bunnies or whatever? There's a pretty pervasive opinion that Tiny Toons was merely a stepping stone to eventually get to the pure, unadulterated greatness of Animaniacs, and while I do love Animaniacs a lot, I think it's an unfair position to put Tiny Toons into. There's a lot that Tiny Toons brings to the table that Animaniacs is lacking, and I would even say that I'm the type of lunatic that prefers the style of Tiny Toons over Animaniacs. And there's a lot of reasons one could think that, so let's get right into it. It's not solely because I'm a massive contrarian or a massive furry that worships Babs Bunny's feet or whatever. My relationship with the furry community is as complicated externally as it is internally, and we'll be here all day unpacking that nightmare. Let's just say I am a fan of Sonic the Hedgehog, and you do with that information what you will. Not to say the furry fandom isn't a huge part of this whole show, because my god, is it a huge part of this. Don't I have just the cutest toes? Lovely. In fact, why don't I dig just a little bit deeper here? Probably the first thing that you'd notice about this show, in comparison to Animaniacs and even a lot of its contemporaries, and Looney Tunes, is that the colors are fucking wild in this show. It's not quite neon, but it is certainly some kind of Care Bears-ass pastel rainbow colors. Cyan and pink and purple and green just really scream in your eyes like a Nintendo Power ad come to life. And you got those big expressive eyes and a bigger focus on, like, teen romance, and you got a potent brew of building THE furry aesthetic that's standard to this day, as well as sexually confusing plenty of children. Now, it's 2020, so I am far beyond mocking the furry fandom like it's fucking something awful forum post circa 2006, but I just find it interesting that so much of the DNA of Tiny Toons still finds itself in modern furry fandom that I see recommended to me on Twitter via somebody's likes. I actually really like the in-your-face colors and the more focused aesthetic. Like, yeah, it's definitely stealing wholesale from Muppet Babies, but it's not like Jim Henson invented bright and colorful characters. He just perfected it like the angelic godman that he is. I want to point out that despite it being like Muppet Babies, they are not literally babies, which is a nice touch. It's more in line with, like, a pup named Scooby-Doo, where they're pre-teens or, like, vaguely teens. I mean, they go to high school slash college and are, like, hormonal and everything, so... Okay, maybe the setting isn't airtight. I just wanted to make sure we were on the same page, that you wouldn't believe how many folks still mix this show up with baby Looney Tunes. The for real literal babification of Looney Tunes. This is important, so we'll get back to this fact later. So yeah, maybe it's not 100% focused with its setting, but the world of Acme Luniversity actually feels like a world, and as arbitrary as trying to forge any emotional connection between Buster Bunny and Dizzy Devil is, it is still nice that there's a token attempt to keep the setting and characters consistent. In Animaniacs, the Warners kind of fulfilled whatever role they needed to for the short, and usually all acted as one unit. There was rarely a short that was just about one of them. Tiny Toons, I would say, inarguably trumps... I mean, usurps 
Animaniacs in terms of characters. If being funny were the only metric we measured these shows under, then yeah, Animaniacs would probably win. But I don't think boiling down a great character-driven comedy like Looney Tunes to just jokes will do them justice. The de facto main characters are Buster and Babs, with Plucky and Hampton being the second stringers and everyone else being varying levels of importance. Between the two mains, Babs is definitely the star of the show, Buster just kind of fucking sucks. Anyway, yeah, Babs rules, she's manic and funny, she's proactive, and she gets into more cartoony antics with funny impressions and dressing up like actor. But she also gets into the real shit, like the expectations of behavior in our society that it thrusts upon women to act a certain way, the struggle of women comedians to carve their own niche, and in general how those with hyperactive personalities are considered a nuisance to others. Her greatest flaw being that she is romantically attracted to lame-ass Buster. What the fuck? Come on! That's not very girl boss of you! When you look at it, though, it almost seems like the creators just wanted to have Babs be the main character and sole successor to Bugs, whereas Buster is like this crappy tacked-on mandate by some asshole at Warner Brothers. It's like the exact opposite of what would usually happen in the 90s with a tacked-on female character. Not to even say that the show is a feminist masterpiece or anything, I mean, the whole joke behind a character like Fifi is that she's a cloying, love-struck lunatic that no guy wants to deal with, but I just want to give a shout out to how fully formed Babs is as a person. Speaking of stupid good voices for stupid good characters, Plucky Duck. Plucky is bar none my favorite character of the bunch, and I truly think, barring Slappy from Animaniacs, Maybe the best and most funny characters between both shows? He's like the Chuck Jones era Daffy, aka my favorite Looney Tune, turned up to 11 and even more desperate and pathetic in a beautiful 90s sort of way. So many good episodes with him, including the funniest stuff in the ahem, OVA, How I Spent My Vacation, alongside Hampton and his horrible family. I think the creators kinda realized how goddamn good Plucky is, cause not only is he often the main character of many episodes, but he got his own clip show spin-off, and a unique new episode all just about him trying out for the role of Batman in Batman Returns and harassing the anime version of Tim Burton, and hopefully bringing about his demise before he inflicted that shitty Charlie and the Chocolate Factory movie on us? You know, I actually really like Hampton too. He's simple, Mostly just an even more gormless version of Porky, but he plays off others really well and has just the right amount of depth to not be as lame as other losers like Furball and fucking Lil Sneezer who is based off some character no human on earth knows or gives a shit about. I think part of the reason this show made many children's hearts a flutter at the sight of a furry babe was that the animators were surely extremely horny for many of them as well. I mean, the most obvious is Julie Bruin, who is this absurdly sexy bear character that got whitewashed and reprocessed into Minerva Mink in Animaniacs. But probably most infamously of these types of characters is Fifi Le Fume. I actually like Fifi as a character, personally. It was a smart move to turn registered sex offender Pepe Le Pew into a lovesick teen girl, and her patheticness and lovelorn desperation is more charming than creepy. With all that said, god damn are people mad horny for this character. Probably a lot of people cling to those personality traits and empathize with or, I don't know, take advantage of it or something. I'm not gonna tackle that in this video. Truth is though, maybe it's a testament to how much people love her because she barely shows up enough to even be considered a secondary character. Now, I jokingly referred to the direct-to-video movie as an OVA earlier, but that was only half a joke. You cannot talk about this show without going into the many, many animation studios contracted to animate for it. See, this is a thing that happens to this day still, but it's usually a little more opaque and only split between, like, two or three studios per show. During the late 80s and early 90s, it wasn't uncommon for shows to have as many as six or seven studios that had their hands on the project to produce a torrent of episodes that were needed for syndication. It's kinda sorta like how now we're in a show like OKKO, OK 
First OKKO OK reference of the year, folks. You can tell by the art style of an episode who storyboarded it. In a show like Tiny Toons, sometimes the episode looks like it was animated entirely different depending on who was in charge. Tokyo Movie Shinsha, or TMS, was consistently the most incredible, elevating anything they touched. But then you get stuff like ACOM, which is decent. But then, Kennedy cartoons that look so awful it drags down even the funniest script. You know those interpolated 60 FPS animation GIFs that you see on Twitter that for some reason somebody must think look good? Well, that's what Kennedy Cartoons looks like 100% of the fucking time on purpose. Watching the show is basically like a fucking game of Russian roulette on either getting guys who animated Akira or... I would say if you want an easy recommendation to get your feet wet with this series, How I Spent My Vacation may be the best possible way to do it. Even if it's the cap of the first season, it's not like you're missing any deep lore by not watching the first season. And it looks absolutely incredible and is probably the single best thing to come out of the show as a whole. And hey, maybe this is where the idea of Fifi being more important than she is came from because she has a big side plot in this movie. Either way, if you watch only one thing from this series, this or the other holiday specials are a good pick for some of that sweet, sweet TMS action. Actually, there is something kind of fun about the guessing game of watching this show. There's something entertaining about seeing that stupid fucking O-face that they make in Kennedy Cartoons episodes and going, ah, fuck, out loud. Watching through the whole first season, it's pretty satisfying to be able to accurately guess exactly who animated an episode before the credits, just from sheer repetition, and how starkly obvious it becomes. It's a great beginner crash course in picking out these kind of subtle differences, and the importance of animation production on the overall quality and readability of a show. I've grown to enjoy seeing the seams in a creative production, now that I make my own severely flawed, but with heart, content about cartoons everybody loves and knows. Like Tiny Toons. I think it's because, to me, a lot of the appeal of this show, particularly, is how messy it is. I'm not trying to say it's perfect or objectively a masterpiece here, because I don't really give a shit about either of those things. This was a show made to be a soulless clone of Muppet Babies, and it was made at a time when shows were written with very little respect for children watching, and yet, it's still funny. It still holds up writing-wise, the characters and aesthetic has endured for decades, and I would personally place it above shows like DuckTales at the time, and it's one foot in the door of the 80s and one foot in the door of the 90s gives it a special kind of weird camp and sincerity that I feel makes it paradoxically more enjoying to watch than something like Animaniacs, which has aged better. It may seem like I'm bashing Animaniacs the whole time, but that's not at all what I'm saying. That show is still one of my favorites and for many of the same reasons, and is just purely funnier in my opinion. My issue is with the comparison in general, or pretending like one show would replace another. I understand they fill pretty much the literally exact same role, but hopefully I've shared enough of why Tiny Toons texturally hits different than Animaniacs, and it's worth watching as a sort of underdog show. And now, Cartoon Network is making a new Tiny Toons, and another baby Looney Tunes show at the same time, just to fuck with us as some kind of cruel joke, or to doom one or both of the shows? Oh, I thought I'd check out HBO Max. Yeah, 1000% on the top of your pee, another bad show that no one will see! On top of the other five different baby shows they are making simultaneously. And hey, I'm optimistic for the new Tiny Toons, actually. I like the new art they showed off. I like that Babs has upgraded from her 80s-ass Nightmare on Elm Street protagonist yellow sweater to a hoodie. That's cool. But I just don't have too much faith that HBO Max and Cartoon Network won't fuck up any chance it had to catch on and become a big thing. Like they did with the horrendous mismanagement of shows like The Fungies or Take and Seek. Sure is a beautiful day. Hi, boss! Especially because, again, we're getting a nostalgic throwback to this lesser-known show 
and a weird baby spinoff that is functionally very similar at the same time. That being said, no amount of superior follow-ups or reboots or alternate reboots or weirdly similar shows or shitty spin-offs can tarnish the star Tiny Toons created and the place it holds in my heart. It made meta funny to kids. It brought passion and love into a type of show that lacked any of that. It defined the Looney Tunes style for a generation and it even might be largely responsible for mainstreaming the furry community. It's endlessly important and even if you still prefer Animaniacs or Freakazoid or God help you bonkers, this show deserves its spot in history just the same.